So in the first video, we talked about w what nucleosomes are and what their composition is. Here we want to talk about where nucleosomes are located within a genome uh, using genome-wide mapping techniques like this one, MNA-seq. So if we want to find out where nucleosomes are, the first thing we do is take an enzyme that will digest DNA uh, that's accessible. Uh, microcockle nuclease, in this case, uh, can chew up the DNA that's in the linker between nucleosomes. Uh, so this region in between the nucleosomes is going to be susceptible to digestion, but the stuff that's in the nucleosome is, is protected. So we treat uh, chromatin with micrococcal nuclease, and it'll chew away all the stuff that's in between nucleosomes, leaving us with just nucleosomal DNA, uh, like this piece here. We can then extract the histones away from the DNA and then just sequence everything that's left behind when we, uh, and map that back onto the genome and ask, okay, uh, if I take a particular piece of DNA, what's the probability that it was still found in the nucleosome versus the probability that it was chewed up by the micrococcal nuclease? Since we get a whole genome's worth of data, we have to have a way of looking at it. Uh, this heat map over here on the right, we've taken every gene in the genome uh, in each, uh, each uh, row in this plot is one piece of DNA. And then we said, okay, if I go to any specific piece, any specific sequence, what's the probability that it was in a nucleosome? Uh, if it was in, if the probability that it was in a nucleosome uh, is low, then we'll make it blue, and if the probability is high, uh, then we'll make it yellow. So we line all these guys up by uh, where the transcription start site for each gene is, and so we've got 6,000 rows in, uh, in this diagram, and we say, okay, I see patterns, so we let the computer sort this out by the patterns, and we can say, for example, here's a whole bunch of genes that have a very strong nucleosome positioned upstream of a place where there's hardly any nucleosomes, and then we see the gene itself, there's a weak pattern of nucleosomes. A more typical pattern is like these guys here, where we don't see anything upstream, but we see this nucleosome depleted region or nucleosome free region. Some people call it, I, I prefer the nucleosome depleted region nomenclature. A very strong positioned nucleosome at uh, what we call the plus one, just inside the transcription start site. And then we have a pattern where uh, we're in between nucleosomes and we see a nucleosome and we're in between nucleosomes. And that pattern fades as we get farther and farther away. So the overall impression we get is that there are places that don't have nucleosomes, the nucleosome depleted region, this blue stripe all the way down. We have usually a strong plus one nucleosome uh, and then that pattern fades away as we go farther into the transcription unit. And that's a fairly typical pattern, as you, you can see here, genome-wide for a yeast genome. Of course, in informatics, we, uh, we average things out and we look at the global picture, but every uh, gene has its own pattern and they, they are all unique. Uh, but that global overall pattern can be visualized at the local level as well. Uh, for example, uh, here's a gene that's being transcribed from right to left. You can see down here that it's not very abundantly transcribed. There's very little mRNA coming from it. It's sitting next to another gene being transcribed from left to right. That's much more abundant. We're getting lots of RNA uh, from this particular gene. Uh, and if we look at the, just the raw reads from an MNA-seq experiment, we can see that here, here's the, the plus one uh, nucleosome for the lightly transcribed gene, uh, and here's the plus one nucleosome for the heavily transcribed gene. And each of them have that pattern where that first nucleosome uh, is quite prominent. There's a nucleosome depleted region on either side of both of those guys, and then uh, minus one for each of those genes. There's also a fairly significant amount of nucleosome. So we sometimes call these two nucleosomes around the nucleosome depleted region the sentinel nucleosomes, and that's a fairly standard pattern for, for yeast genes.
uh, this uh, track below it is trying to pick where the center of the nucleosome is, and it says, okay, uh, this one is fairly well positioned, and it gives a pretty good peak. But as we get out towards the middle of middles of genes, we get a very uh, less robust pattern. Now, the probability of being in a nucleostome is, is still substantial. We're still getting lots of reads out across the middles of these genes, but the computer has a hard time picking where the center of any given nucleosome is. And that tells us that uh, while the occupancy is reasonably high, the positioning is poor. And we'll talk about those terms again in a minute. Just wanted to take a look at a real genome so you realize that uh, the genes aren't sitting side by side uh, like they are in that heat diagram. They're actually running into each other here, so those transcripts are running towards each other. Here's two transcripts running towards each other. Uh, or they can be promoters that are divergent from one another. So the genome is a very complicated place and lots of things happening. Uh, but this overall pattern that the plus one nucleosome and a nucleosome depleted region upstream of it is fairly uh, well conserved and, and, and can be seen at most genes. This is another kind of a plot showing that same thing where instead of we showing a heat map, we reduce everything down to one uh, two-dimensional plot where we have peaks and valleys, so the plus one and the plus two, and you can see that it's dropping off as we go looking at an average gene. Uh, now, again, we can see a minus one nucleosome and a nucleosome depleted region upstream, but we can't go too far. We don't want to interpret this stuff up here too much because to take an average gene, the stuff upstream of it may be another gene coming in this direction or it may be another gene that's being transcribed from right to left. We really don't know in an average gene what's going on up there, so we don't want to look too far upstream and, and interpret that stuff. But we do see these sentinel nucleosomes, the minus one and the plus one, sitting here around a nucleosome depleted region and then drop off of that pattern on average as we go through. So this sort of a plot uh, is something you should be able to interpret. And here's just a, an, another version of that, again, where zero was this transcription start site of every gene. Uh, and and you, you see the same sort of features that uh, we saw in a variety of studies uh, that we've been talking about. And the most important concept here from nucleosome positioning is to understand occupancy and positioning and how they're different. Uh, so this graph, I think, does a good job of that. Uh, showing this, he calls it a nucleosome-free region over here. I, I prefer the nucleosome-depleted region. Uh, and then the plus one nucleosome is both well-positioned. Uh, it's relatively the same distance from the nucleosome, uh, from the transcription start site every time. And it's relatively well-occupied, which means that there's almost always a nucleosome there, and it's almost always in the same relative position. As we look at different genes or even different copies of the same gene, we see that uh, we can have perfectly good occupancy here in this region, but we don't see the nucleosomes being positioned well. So occupancy and positioning are different. Uh, this uh, high occupancy and high positioning would give us a good peak in that uh, graph that we looked at on the last slide. Uh, whereas they'll be all smushed out like this if there's uh, good occupancy but low positioning. That is, not all the nucleosomes are in the same position with, in different molecules in, the same, uh, in a population. So occupancy and position are the two terms we're going to use to describe uh, nucleosome array patterns, and you need to understand the difference between them and uh, to be able to interpret one of these diagrams to tell you whether occupancy or positioning are being affected. Another feature of, of nucleosomes that's going to be important for understanding gene expression is that the histones can often be post-translationally modified. So we're going to consider the effect of modifications of the histones. That's going to change the properties of the nucleosome in two ways. One, it just changes their flavor so that other proteins that come along and are sensing what's going on with the histones will bind to those modifications and do things locally. We'll talk about examples. Second thing is they can actually change the physical properties of the nucleosome. So modifications can make a nucleosome less stable or more stable. Uh, and they can also signal that this would be a, a, a nucleosome that's associated with, uh, say, a promoter.
Uh, so the modifications are going to be important. There's information in these, in these post-translational modifications of the histones. Uh, the things that put those modifications there we're going to call writers, things that add covalent modifications to histones. The things that come along and notice that they're there will bind to histones that have modifications and therefore will bind to nucleosomes that have modified histones. And the, the fact that they can interact with those modifications will change the properties of these readers. So the things that are reading the modifications will call readers. And then once we don't want that information there anymore, we need these modifications to be temporary uh, because our decisions about whether or not to express genes are temporary and we need to be able to change our mind. So we need to have things that can take those modifications away and those will be the erasers of the information. So you need to understand the nomenclature, writers, readers, and erasers, and the importance of histone modifications uh, because those modifications are going to change the, the properties of chromatin uh, in a local sense instead of in a global sense. I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is what the modifications look like. You'll hear about acetylation, uh, uh, methylation. Note that there are three methylation states, one, two, and three methyl groups that can be put onto a single lysine, or two methyls that can be put onto an arginine, uh, phosphorylation. All these things happen. Uh, some of them will change the physical properties, and they can all be read by a variety of things. You might want to sit and take a look at this uh, chart, uh, uh, but overall, it's, it's not something you need to commit to memory. It's just something you need to be aware of there being modifications. So we already looked at this slide in the nucleosome video, but I want to remind you now while we're talking about modifications that a lot of these modifications are happening on the parts that were not in the structure that we looked at. So a lot of those lysines and arginines and the serines and threonines are sitting out in these tails, the N-terminal tails that extend away from the globular core of the nucleosome core particle. Uh, I only point it out here to, to again stress that while it's possible for modifications to change the physical properties of a nucleosome, for example, we'll talk about uh, a histone H3 modification right down in this region at the entry-exit point that can loosen that, uh, uh, the association of DNA with the nucleosome. But for the most part, they're really not going to do that. They're just going to sit out here as information that readers can come along, bind to this part of the nucleosome, and decide whether they ought to do something to this nucleosome. So a, a lot of the information is just flapping around in the breeze and is not actually changing the physical properties of the nucleosome. It's just changing the way that they associate with readers. So here's that example that we know of where uh, the, a residue on H3, this lysine 56, is sitting right near the entry-exit point here. So here's the entry-exit point of the DNA. That lysine, when it's uh, a lysine that's unmodified, can interact uh, with this phosphodiester backbone uh, on the DNA and stabilize that interaction. But if we acetylate it, we're going to lose the positive charge on the lysine, and that's going to weaken this interaction, and it'll be easier to displace uh, the, this, uh, the, the DNA from the entry-exit point, and it'll start to unpeel the DNA from a nucleosome. So that's at least one example that we know of where we can change the physical properties of a nucleosome. But for the most part, these are going to be just information-bearing molecules. So we have dozens of sites that we can modify, several different modifications that we can make, uh, and they can all be uh, made in various combinations and permutations that are going to affect the nucleosomes. So it's important for you to understand that we can change the flavor of a nucleosome uh, but it's not important for you to have a strong grasp of exactly what modifications do what. I just want you thinking, okay, I can write a lot of information on the histones that say uh, things like, uh, this would not be a good place to start, a tr uh, uh, to start transcribing, or this is a good place, there's probably a promoter near here. So uh, all sorts of information can be encoded in the histones, now that can be changed quite easily by either removing the histones or removing the mark. So these decisions are temporary and can be changed quite easily, and yet they have very s strong uh, effects on whether or not we transcribe and therefore whether or not we express uh, the, the genes that are in any particular region of the, of the genome.
So to understand gene expression, we have to think, aha, the DNA is uh, encapsulated within these nucleosomes. It's in chromatin, and the properties of the chromatin vary locally. We can re write and rewrite uh, information about whether or not the, those regions of the genome ought to be transcribed. This is just here to convince you that these modifications matter. So here's a particular example where in, in uh, human females, the X chromosome, uh, there are two copies of the X chromosome. One is active and one is transcriptionally repressed, the, uh, almost the entire chromosome. Uh, and the inactive X, uh, we can detect it here by fluorescence in situ hybridization. Uh, or uh, we can stain the cells uh, for uh, one of those modifications of a histone, in this case trimethylation of histone K27, and you can see that uh, that uh, uh, shows up as uh, across the entire inactive X chromosome, we have a very high level of this repressive mark. Now, methylation isn't always repressive. Some other methylations of histones are associated with active, transcriptionally active regions. Uh, so the details are confusing, but I just wanted to give you an example here that shows that uh, an inactive X chromosome has a lot of this, inactive, this transcriptionally repressive mark. Uh, same thing shown over here on the right. Uh, the inactive X is also associated with the, this long non-coding RNA called EXIST. So there's lots of layers that we can put onto a piece of DNA to either make it more or less likely that it's going to be transcribed. Some of those layers have to do with RNAs that you'll be talking about later in the course, and some of them have to do with histone modifications uh, like the ones we're seeing here. Again, the details aren't important, uh, but if we look genome-wide in a yeast cell, uh, and, and to some extent in, in other cells as well, we see these patterns of, of modifications that are associated as we take an average gene and say, okay, well, where do I find these things? Uh, so, for example, uh, histone acetylation uh, we find associated with promoters, the beginnings of genes, uh, not so much with the transcription units themselves. Uh, the methylation of H3K4, lysine number 4, uh, we see monomethylation down here at the 3' prime end, dimethylation in the middle, and trimethylation associated with promoters. So again, uh, as we look across transcription units, we not only see that there are modifications that are associated with initial events, but as the transcription proceeds, we change those modifications uh, in ways that seem to be important. Some of them we understand, some of them we don't, but we definitely see patterns of modifications changing as we look through transcription units. At least one reason for this uh, is that the readers and writers and erasers of information are associated with the polymerase. So when we start to ask, well, which one is cause and which one is effect, do, do we modify the histones so that we can attract a polymerase? Or does the polymerase uh, make the modifications as it goes through? And the answer is a little bit of each. So the RNA polymerase, Pol2, uh, has a catalytic domain that's doing the, the act of transcription. It needs to make its way through a nucleosomal template, so it has to have some help getting through nucleosomes, but it also needs to put them back together afterwards so that we don't leave a big gap after uh, we're done. So the RNA polymerase has a long uh, C-terminal domain, a long unstructured tail that carries along a variety of things that it might need, things that will allow us to take apart nucleosomes, things that allow us to put them back together, and also the modifying enzymes that those methyl transferases and uh, other uh, writers of information that are going to write information, for example, I have just transcribed this. Uh, why that's useful information, we can imagine, uh, but for the most part, we're still working on understanding what kinds of information are being written uh, and removed here, but it is worth noting that the readers, writers, and erasers are associated with the RNA polymerase itself. So the ultimate picture we get is that the things that are going to transcribe a piece of DNA, the things that are going to modify the histones on it, and the things that are going to make it possible to do both of those things are all interacting with each other uh, in a cooperative manner. So the RNA polymerase down here 
can't get through the nucleosome unless it's carrying some uh, s sort of uh, machinery that will allow it to weaken the nucleosome. Uh, one of the things that does that is, the, is a set of histone chaperones we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, it's going to decide whether or not it should do that by sensing whether or not the modifications on those histones that exist are appropriate for the action that it's considering and it's carrying along a bunch of modifying machinery that's going to change those modification states. So both the, 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 the RNA polymerase is both uh, changing and reacting to the modification states of the histones. One of the things it might decide to do, uh, depending on whether the histones have the right modifications, is to do what's called ATP-dependent remodeling, and you'll be hearing more uh, about that in a later lecture. Uh, suffice to say here that the ATP-dependent remodeling involves taking a nucleosome from the position where it is now and moving it by hydrolyzing ATP and actually uh, making the DNA, uh, uh, the, the octomer, translocate along the DNA. So we can actually move the nucleosomes out of the way. Uh, that may reveal a spot that an RNA polymerase wants to w work on, or uh, it might cover one up. So remodelers could both be activating or, or repressing. Uh, that process then interacts with the histone chaperones. The remodeler might decide that it wants to take that nucleosome apart, or it may need something to put the thing back together after the remodeler is gone. So all these processes have to collaborate with one another, making for a very complicated interaction ma matrix that ultimately ends up adjusting the probability of transcription into the range that we need to maintain viability. So we talked about readers and writers uh, and erasers uh, of information on the histones, and you'll be talking about uh, ATP-dependent remodeling later. Uh, that leaves us with the chaperones that we haven't talked about. So here's the concept of the chaperone. Uh, we saw in the nucleosome video that the histones will bind very tightly to each other and they also make very intimate contact with DNA. Uh, before they're in a nucleosome or when they're taken out of a nucleosome, they still have those properties. They have uh, extensive hydrophobic surfaces that will, will make interactions with other proteins. They have highly charged surfaces that will interact with RNA and DNA. Uh, basically, unless they're with each other, we can't trust the, the histones uh, to not bind to a bunch of other things. This reminded people uh, of the concept of a chaperone at a high school dance who's there to prevent inappropriate interactions between complementary interfaces, if you follow my drift. Uh, so they called it the same thing. Uh, and so we call the things that bind to the histones while they're not in nucleosomes chaperones. And the general idea is that the chaperones will bind to histones. Uh, if we were building this nucleosomes, these uh, histones may have just been synthesized and they have to be carried from the ribosome off to the site of assembly. Uh, so they can't be trusted to, to make it there without getting into trouble. So we put them on a chaperone. The chaperone can then shuttle them off to the site where nucleosomes are being assembled. But these reactions are all reversible, so if we're taking a nucleosome apart, we want the chaperones to hold on to the histones as well. And this particular example showed a chaperone called NAP1, or nucleosome assembly protein 1. Uh, but other chaperones are present in the cell, uh, FACT and SPT6 are, are also chaperones that can both uh, assemble and disassemble nucleosomes. So chaperones have an important role in making sure the histones don't get into trouble uh, when they're not in nucleosomes. The chaperone function is useful in lots of circumstances, as we've been pointing out. Uh, as the RNA polymerase moves through chromatin, it has to uh, identify the next nucleosome that needs to be at least temporarily removed, take those pieces away, but it can't leave that hole there, otherwise it would just clear all the nucleosomes off of the, the gene every time it transcribed it, and then we would get into trouble because we don't have the repressive barrier uh, to other events that the nucleosomes provide. So we need the chaperones to hang on to those pieces so they don't drift away, and we need to reassemble them as quickly as possible behind the RNA polymerase. This also has at least 
uh, we think has the advantage of not allowing all those modifications to be lost every time we transcribe a gene. Remember, these histones are heavily modified to tell us where we are in, a, in, a, in the genome. Uh, and we don't want to lose that information, so we want to reassemble the nucleosomes with the same histones that we just took off. And the chaperones seem to have a tethering function that helps us accomplish that. Uh, so they keep us from getting into trouble when we temporarily take a nucleosome apart by allowing us to reassemble the nucleosome with the same pieces. So if we stand back and summarize all that, uh, if we look at DNA sequences, some DNA sequences simply don't like to have histones associated with them, so they form natural nucleosome depleted regions. Uh, since there are nucleosome depleted regions, DNA binding proteins like the one you heard about earlier in the course can get to those sites without having to move a nucleosome. So the nucleosome depleted regions offer the opportunity to let specific DNA binding proteins bind. Those DNA binding proteins can then recruit other things like remodelers that will establish these plus one and minus one nucleosomes. They'll enforce the nucleosome depleted region and establish the, those sentinel nucleosomes by pushing the nucleosomes to just the right position. So part of the pattern we see is going to be due to the sequence of the DNA that'll establish these NDRs. Part of it's going to be due to the remodelers that then push the nucleosomes back and forth until we get them in the right place. Uh, and part of it is just going to be the size of the linker uh, that determines how far it is to the next nucleosome after we've decided to put one here. When we then go to transcribe these things, the transcription factors uh, can then recruit RNA polymerase. Uh, it can then sense whether or not the plus one nucleosome is the sort of a nucleosome that ought to be removed temporarily so that we can transcribe through this region. And all of this is going to be going back and forth uh, as, as a collaborative process with the modifying readers, writers, and erasers that are changing the way that the histone uh, modification pattern is, which will change the properties of that nucleosome, uh, along with the remodelers and the chaperones that will use that same information uh, to determine whether or not they have to move these nucleosomes around or perhaps temporarily remove them. So that's the general idea of how, how chromatin structure is established, how the pattern of nucleosome positioning and occupancy gets established, uh, and how it affects whether or not we, we transcribe particular regions of the genome and at what uh, uh, probability we, we transcribe particular regions of the genome.